Because when is science yes. is your God, then you are just another experiment in science. No, it's, it's very true. When you, when you start seeing yourself as the, um, as the subject rather than the observer. Yeah. World, world of Warcraft first is metaverse. Just, metaverse. It's, it's the very first metaverse. It's also just a microcosm of the social order of reality. I mean, we've you got can build up these strong emotions about someone and maybe even build up this fantasy about them and then have your heart broken and then they're yep. just gone. They're just a void. They're just never it's seen It's as them. though they never existed. Yes. I'm like that. We're walking in the metaverse, I think. This is we're what the metaverse digitized. is. Yeah, this looks like the metaverse. It feels like we're breaking out of the metaverse right now, like a server. I mean, that, if you think about it, I mean, that's, that's what uh, I know that you didn't, you haven't played this game yet, but that's what the Arbiter's story is basically about, is he breaks out of the metaverse where he's like, wait a second, the rings don't <laughs> well, send you. They actually kill everybody. It's a lie he's been told his whole life. Exactly. Just like the idea that, and all, funnily enough, the, the idea that technology can lead, can lead to some sort of spiritual enlightenment. Here's the funny thing about technology. The original technology, I think, is what we call psychedelics. I agree. It was the, the That's very nature's first technology. Very first outside source of information. It is a natural technology. It might have even been what has given us the knowledge we have, the fruit of knowledge, as it were, perhaps the original one. The modern yeah. day fruit of knowledge is the iPhone, I would say. Apple, I mean, personified through the through Apple, but uh, not limited to, obviously. But you know what I mean. Of course, I mean it's it's just it's funny that they had the foresight to name their company that. I don't think they did have the foresight. I think it's just one of those things that works out that way because, well, fate is uh, a funny thing. Sometimes it it's, really is. You realize that, well, <laughs> it's kind of. I feel of like they had to have had some idea, though. Like, like having their logo be the apple with the bite taken out of it. It's yes and and no. It's it was yes, on some part when Steve Jobs and Wozniak conceived of that logo. They, uh, they I'm sure they had some obviously like cultural information of the bi biblical stories of all kinds of mythological stories of course so that that somewhat informed them but that's just that's that's how everything is isn't it it's always based on something before yeah that's everything I, I would, cyclical, cyclical in that way in in, this, in in the vein of what you're talking about right now i could see it in a way of like it's that kind of almost like the same way that you see with like the sort of like haha edgy satanism thing Mm -hmm. Or it's like, you know what I mean? Where like people are like, oh yeah, but like it's just a joke. Right. And it's right. like, well, what's the difference between the joke and the truth? Exactly. And I mean, exactly. as, as I'm sure you know, the first Apple computer was priced at 666. Mm -hmm. When you tell a joke enough times, when you tell yourself anything enough times, it kind of become, it, it's spoken into reality. You, you start acting... It starts out as something you might scoff at, something maybe you joke with, something maybe you act out ironically. That's a very common thing, of course. But whatever it is, you know, a, a behavioral pattern, a belief system, there's, number, there's a number of things that could... Uh, it's a program you're running, really. But at first, it's met with laughter and, like, dismissal or some sort of comedic interpretation, sure. But the point is that when you joke about something enough... And when you kind of act something out enough, it becomes you. Yes, absolutely. This is trippy. It's almost so. like, it's like the concept of willing things into existence, where it's like the, the sort of, you tell yourself something enough and you start to believe it. Absolutely. This is trippy. Whoa. Yeah, and this part's really cool. I love this like EDM music too. House music. Right? What what graphics are you playing in, by the way? Because I I prefer the older graphics for this. I'm, I'm on old graphics. Yeah. I'm yeah, me too. Graphics. It's nice. Kind of feels like and, you're there. 
much like we're we're talking about repeating things enough and and the shaping reality with that way it's like that that's kind of what bugs me about the internet these days honestly is is like the idea that there are so many falsehoods perpetuated and they are perpetuated enough to the point that you can't tell the difference i think you, you know can I mean? tell the difference though i can tell when people are genuine oh, still like i mean like like you can tell the difference if you look hard enough but i mean the you that i'm using is not you mean the average the person you of course yeah, i mean i mean by, but don't the, be, by then, you i mean the observer you know what i mean like oh i see what you're saying like that's just a it's just a Another hurdle, basically, right? I mean, because that's how I view it. I view yes. It's definitely adding to the confusion, to the difficulty of life at this point in more ways than it's helping, I would say. But to that extent, you could still, what you said about shaping your reality around you is still just as true. That's the thing. Like, you can manipulate, well, manipulate is a bad word because... Shape, I, I would say. Yeah, because manipulate implies some sort of deceit, but I don't think you need deceit either. I think you can just, like you said, shape, maybe go with, not everything is under your control, so I don't want to imply that, but just in the sense that you can sort of still make your experience a very positive, a very, uh, you could still be the controller of your reality, if that makes sense. Absolutely. The, uh, author of your life if you will you still have uh you still have free will ultimately. Be, yes you, have you freedom. still have free will that's the word that i was looking for and i think that's something you and i both value freedom i would definitely say so yeah. free will i, I mean, mean free will is freedom it's the same thing free will is just a legal language definition of you know one's one's type of um, one type of uh, f thing that just, in other words, free will is just the basis of, of any concept of freedom to begin with. The idea that, not even the idea, the experience of, I guess, the experience of uh, shaping the course of life. Creating. It's a very good way to put it, actually, where it's like, I feel like if you, if you don't believe, or not even necessarily believe, but if you don't recognize the agency inherent in, in humans having free will, then the, the very concept of freedom doesn't seem as relevant and important to you. Exactly. Or it, it, if you don't believe that people have free will and you just think that they're motivated by whatever chemical signals in your brain or whatever... And it's like, oh, well, like, it almost becomes, humanity becomes a sort of thing to be managed and controlled and not mm -hmm. a thing to be fostered for growth. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's, your beliefs inform, that's what I always say, it's like, it starts with beliefs. Politics and culture, everything else is just a, a downstream of what you believe in. Dare I even say, you start to view humanity as the flood. Mm. A sort of consuming thing that is motivated only by impulse. That should just be cleansed, sterilized. Yeah. That should be cleansed, contained, contained. And studied. Like a specimen of scientific observation. Exactly. And see, that's where science is leading us to be one of the experiments. Because when is science yes. is your god, then you are just another experiment in science. No, it's it's very true. When you when you start seeing yourself as the um, as the subject rather than the observer, that's where you become subject to all kinds of hells. Exactly, that's when you become a subject. You don't. That's become when a ruler. you become a subject. I mean, it's really quite. It's pretty self-explanatory yeah. right there, right? That's there's not that's not a very Shit. complicated oh. idea. Oh, I that's let's hope that's not symbolic of anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm reading way too far into that. Yeah, sometimes it happens. I may have had a micro trip today. <laughs> and I've been channeling Terrence McKenna ever since. He's been channeling the mycelium. In my brain, one might say. <laughs> but 
But anyways, about this Matrix business, I frankly have no interest in participating in it. No. Oh. I mean, it's like, it's the sort of... I mean, like, here's the thing. Is it's going to be trite for me to bring this up, but, oh, I have no idea how I managed to get that grenade there. I'm going to be <laughs> completely wrong. Okay. But... This is moving at a breakneck pace. We're trying yes, to break out of the server room, and it's just so many layers of... <laughs> <laughs> this is, we couldn't have picked a better mission. We really could. Like, honestly, like, <laughs> this is what it feels like as we're t- talking about these ideas. So it really does. I'm just. I just fell but again. I just. I just killed you <laughs> with a shotgun. You, I think you did. <laughs> I think you did. You put me out of my misery. I mean, that was yeah. dark. Sometimes it's better than being a mach- uh, slave to the machines. Yeah, I mean, the, I, the mass hordes of zombies. You know, we are going to need exoskeletons like these in the future, though. So that's the one benefit of. Technology. Yeah, I've been talking about that for years. I'm like, that's that's what. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is rough, <laughs> man. This is tough. This is this is unnormal, by yeah, the way. This for, like, yeah, this is hard. Yeah, this is unnormal. But uh, I forgot how g- games back in like this era and the '90s, and just the further back in time you go, the more difficult games were. Honestly, oh, for sure. It, it's because they weren't. Oh, this is actually very relevant. They were actually meant to be challenges. In a in a way, they were meant to be much like reality is unfair. Mm, exactly. Like, like them, the, they're I, a the test concept, of skill. They're a test of, yes. Yeah. And I feel like it's, it's now a very common misconception with games is that it's very good game design for everything to be completely fair. And like, if you are a reasonably good player, you should be able to do it with no mistakes, but that's not what reality is. No matter how good you are, you'll still make mistakes. You'll still get fucked over. And that's what these games are like. Fine. It's like it's a learning yeah, experience too. Exactly, and it makes it all the more rewarding when you beat the odds and you know that you mm-hmm. weren't supposed to win, but you still did. That's the entire story you know, of like, Halo itself. Yeah, that's that's the whole point: is that you're not supposed to win, but you do. That's what that's what has made stories throughout time inspiring. I mean, compelling. I mean, it's kind of propelled the human race forward. That story of survival against the odds and I guess deeper than that, finding some sort of way to make sense of all the chaos of the world and be, you know, at peace with it, I guess, or at least survive and make the best of it, you know? Exactly, to beat the odds. And that's, I feel like that's, that's why Halo is such a human story. And I mean, we were even talking about with the new uh, the Halo Infinite marketing is like, with uh, the old Halo Three marketing, especially like when there were those things with like like the veterans of the Human Covenant War is what it was supposed to be, they made it apparent that it was like supposed to be like a very human story. And I mean, I feel like human stories at their core are about eat- beating the odds. And I mean, like you, the reason that like that they're even called the Spartans in Halo is because there's three hundred of them and they have an impossible mm. battle to win. And like that's why the Battle of Thermopylae is one of the most iconic stories in human history. Is that 300 dudes held back an army it, like there was absolutely no reason for them to win as much as they did aside from the fact that they just refused to lose because the that's will of what the human spirit is exactly the will of the human spirit is not to be underestimated that's for sure that is that's what history really if there's anything to be learned from history i would say that is one of the biggest takeaways is that there is a goodness at the core of the human spirit despite all the i think horrible you know atrocities and wicked deeds and stuff the will to persevere and really to live to survive has been an inspiration i mean i think that's what much of the modern world is sort of this piece of that we've grown up in i suppose is predicated on that is this sort of reverence to the people who gave their lives for us to survive. You know, that's always what, what I was told growing up and about history, you know, was world war two and one, and just all these, all this strife and not just them, you know, revolutions and all these other, all these wars and stuff, they were, um, you know, you, you got some, some part of it was you got inspired because it was like, and they survived, you know, and, and yes. in the end, good prevailed or something like that, you know? Uh, at well, least that is that's, what, you what know. to me has always asserted the concept of free will is the fact that that's, I think that's what separates humans from pretty much everything else. 
And like, I'm, I'm sure that people will make the argument that, that dogs do this for people too, but that's because we've shaped them so much. But where humans are, as far as I'm aware, really the only creatures who not just their children, but other humans, they will give their lives in, in against the order of nature. Mm. They, they will forfeit their own survival for which they have absolutely no personal interest in to ensure the idea of that, sacrifice uh, yes, they will for the sacrifice greater good themselves for what they believe in for what they believe in i think that's key well that that's the key part actually is there is sacrifice done in the animal kingdom for the greater good in these kinds of things they're very instinctual but the thing about us the experiment that we are is that we choose is that we choose is that we are we're self-aware we can choose not to we can choose to be selfish the wickedness that we see in humans is actually what makes us it the goodness that you see in them you know is is a choice <laughs> do you know what exactly. i'm saying that's why it's good that's why it's that's why i would argue that it's that it's almost it's instinct to be evil or not not necessarily evil but i mean selfish it's instinct to be selfish but it it is free will and it is choice to be selfless well okay mm Ooh, that's a that gets really deep into philosophical territory. Let me see if I can unpack that. Okay, wait. The basically instinct. Okay, I instinct to be selfish. I mean, I feel like there are instincts of caring for your fellow. I think our instincts are actually connected to uh, free will, if that makes sense. Yes. Well, that, that's I actually let me elaborate on that real quick. Or I feel like. In a way, I, well, instinct is derived from the past experiences of, of your species. Mm -hmm. And I feel like humans have chosen to be selfless for long enough that it has become instinct. Mm. To a certain degree. You know what I mean? But it is rooted in a choice. There's no, there's no evolutionary... Well, that's Cain and Abel, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But essentially, yes, I know what you're talking about. Like, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, your choices affect a long line of people that's kind of one aspect of of it for sure is that your choices have a huge resounding effect on your kids your ancestors to come uh and also you know the people around you that you impact and these definitely i, I think can transcend generations and they often do I was going to ask you, what do you think of, I believe it's called epigenetic memory. Right. That's like the, the, yeah. the idea that memories are passed down like subconsciously. I think that's way, the scientific understanding of exactly what I just described. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, you know, people always say it's genes or the environment. It's both at the same time, basically. Genes are just one form genes of. Genes are a factor. Yeah. Well, but they're one type of expression of the same phenomenon. Of the yes. same, there are two ways of measuring the same expression is what I would say. And one of them yes. is at a more, you know, whatever genetic biological level. And one of them is at a more environmental impact level. But you're, what happened, because what you just said about epigenetics, the environment has been shown to shape genes. So it's both. It's both genes create, or yeah, genes are responsible. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Genes Let's speaking. Go ahead. I mean, that was timely because what I'm about to say is that genes <laughs> yeah. are a response to the environment. So that was an instinct yeah. you just had in response to the virtual environment we find ourselves in. <laughs> speaking of uh, finding ourselves in virtual environments, right? How do you see a way? that virtual environments can be used for good and for ill? I know that's a very broad question, but I mean, like... I think for What do you see as the is, upside and what do you see as the downside? Well, let's start with the... Should we start with the... I feel like we should start with the downside because... Definitely. It's right in front of us. I mean, not right <laughs> now. This is actually a pretty good part of, of it, I would say. This but is the upside. This we're is the playing upside. right now, yeah. But the downside is like... I mean, the... What it, what is essentially a time loop of Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, uh, Facebook. I mean, just these Google, all these platforms that we spend so much of our time on. 
and we give so much of our information to, of course, but more importantly, our time, we don't really get that much out of it usually, but we're all, we're, I mean, I could say I'm guilty of like wasting way too much time uh, on these platforms. And that's basically this corporate sponsored, corporate controlled, you know, sort of other reality of social media, but it's not just social media. It's, I mean, you know, World of Warcraft or, yep. I mean, whatever, you know, New World by Amazon. Hmm. You know, like, <laughs> yep. so the point is whatever that is, is expanding, obviously. And well, that's the concern. But I, I on the upside, something, you know, podcasts are great, but I think they're scratching the surface of what could be a much deeper thing where it's something like, well, I've been listening to Terrence McKenna lately, which is pretty obvious from this conversation. And, you know, when you, when you listen to someone like that, or you just listen to anyone who actually has some, something worth listening to some wisdom to gain from perhaps, um, it can be a guide. It can be a, uh, a source of useful psychological nourishment, if you will. Sure. Spiritual nourishment, whatever. Obviously I, I, you know, this is completely separate from, you always have to clarify things on the internet, I guess, but which is the problem with the information age is that there's so much minutia we have to sift through even now. But, uh, of course I'm not implying you have parasocial relationships with any of these people, but the point is the ideas, not the people. <laughs> Terrence McKenna is yes. dead. He's dead. Uh, and maybe that's why I feel a certain safety in a way. Maybe that's why people connect with dead artists actually is because you know that you're just there for the ideas at this point. You're not there to Story see is them. written. Yeah. Yes. You value their artistry, pure and simple. There's no two ways about it. There's no uncertainty in a way. It's like it's your, there's, yes. there's, there's a period on the end of that sentence. Exactly. It's something exactly that's it's it's a it's a foundation, perhaps, or many of them together build a foundation. I mean, I have no qualms about admitting that music is a big part. You know, different artists I listen to are a big part of my inspirations or my foundation when it comes to, you know, certain types of expression. I mean, that, that's the sort of the thing that let I mean, like you even think of like in the animal kingdom, right? The part of the reason that. I mean, like, this is a perfect example, right? Octopi, right? Right. They, the reason that they're not top of the food chain is because they don't pass on their knowledge. Right. Parents die when the children are born. There's no, like, they can't have a culture. Hmm. You know what I mean? There's no, there's no exchange of ideas. Every octopus is, like, starting fresh in the world. You know, the thing about Humans octopus, Humans are unique though. that they have uh, elders. Octopus are like ghosts, aren't they? That's a, that's a good way to put it, but please elaborate. You know, what's funny about octopi, I don't know if you know this, but that's funny that you bring that up because I learned recently that octopi have this very alien sort of language because the way that they communicate with each other is not Their through... skin, right? It's through sh the shifting patterns and colors and translucent luminescence of their strange bodies and that's how they communicate they literally become the message they embody yeah. the idea so in a way their form of communication is more pure than ours because we're bogged down with language and words and all this but you know those are they never deal with capture. abstraction and they become what they, they believe become the way. abstraction yes, yes which is the most that's a pretty advanced form of language, if you ask me. Oh, I agree with you, absolutely. And what's That's why even they're my more, favorite animal, yeah. What's even more interesting is that, if you think about it, where is the most long-term place an organism can live and, and survive and maybe even improve its communication? Perhaps in the depths of the ocean, where all these, you know, we're on land, we're, we're mammals, but we're... In a way, you know, land, there's all these problems. You're, you're exposed to more uh, natural disasters, catastrophes, atmospheric conditions. Um, you're just more bound to the material. But water, the ocean, is this just vast void. of It's like space. I mean, 
They're aliens. Yeah, they might as well be the the octopi. I mean, because that's the kind of environment they inhabit. No, no, you're dead right. I mean, it's also that's also kind of the tragedy of it to me. And what, what I find so fascinating is that you would think they would live all, live a lot longer than we do. Hmm. You know what don't. I mean? Like, but they don't. It's almost like. In a, it, it, I'm pretty sure that they actually, like the mother octopus, I could be getting this wrong. This is off the dome right here, but I'm pretty sure that the mother octopus dies intentionally. Hmm. The mother octopus dies to provide nourishment for her children. Like they eat her. Mm -hmm. And it, it's... Well, there you go. She became they're, 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 let me the put nourishment. They're very, that's what I'm saying is they're, they're in a weird way. They're, they're almost like the purest organism they in are. the sense that they are pure self-sacrifice. They're pure expression. Yes. They're pure expression. Maybe they're, you know, and I, and I think we're just as, they're just a different expression of consciousness than we are, you know? And the dolphins, those are, I don't know, they're up to, they're Atlanteans, I think. They're not, they're a freak of nature. They're freaks. They're a, I think dolphins are evil. They might be evil. I'm, I'm not sure. I, give me your argument. Red pill me on dolphins. Uh, they rape a hell of a lot of people. That's true. And that's true. Uh, I think that's really weird. It's kind of like, they're, sus. They're, I mean, uh, let me it, put it this way. Dolphins are very, very id-centric. They, they, mm. they're, they're surprisingly <laughs> violent. They, they seem to revel in pleasure. They're kind of hedonistic in a sense. Yes, they're extremely hedonistic. Dude, they're Atlanteans. For, I'm telling you, yeah, that's, that, that, that's that why Atlantis fell. And sense. they turned into fucking dolphins. They I hate that that makes sense, actually. I really do. I don't. I love it. It's just, it's all coming together. Plato was right. I mean, we're all, we're in his cave anyways. So, of course, he was right about Atlantis, too. Oh, my God. Dolphins fucking freak me out, man. They're, they're just like... We're Every staring into the id. Them. We're staring into the id. Yes, in the exactly. end, which is a part of us too. That's the thing. It's inside of us too. There's a bit of dolphin mm -hmm. in us. Some people like raping. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know. It's true. No, it's it's. They're they're um, in a weird way. Let me put it this way. I feel like the octopus embodies the super ego. Mm, now and you're on to something. The yeah. dolphin embodies the id. That is a good. That is a good way of putting it. Yeah. The 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 octopus will give everything selflessly, but the the dolphin will seek what it wants and it will take what it wants. Okay, now let us study the Sasquatch for a moment, the closest <laughs> known ancestor to man. Uh I would say they embody What do they embody? Just the normal ego? Sasquatch is a kind guess. of narcissistic. Or, or I was gonna say like 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 uh like great apes, right? Great apes, yeah. I think that they they really do embody the ego. Do they? How does that yeah. really work? In, in the sense of like, they they just kind of hang out. <laughs> That's true. You know what I mean? They're, they're Is very that the ego the hierarchy? Though? Yeah, they're very in the hierarchy. Hierarchy. Yeah. Okay. There's chimp wars. That's Not even thing. just the wars. I mean, they're they're social order. They're very concerned with their social status, order. status. Yes, that's they're very true. much about status and in a that's weird way, true. like the material. That's true. Grooming. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. I think we've just cracked. I'm going to make a new band and one person's going to be the ego, the other person, the super ego, and the other person, the id. It's going to be it's called. Amazing. Uh, Plato's, the animal kingdom. Plato's animals. <laughs> yeah. One of us is going to be a dolphin. One of us is going to be an ape. The other one, uh, the octopus. The uh, drummer's uh, the octopus. Dude, the, I, I kind of being an octopus would be sick. Of those, it three. would. <clears throat> You're essentially a ghost. Like that's kind of cool. No, no that, that's really like when right when you said that, I was like, that's a really good way to describe what they are. Actually, that's our boy right there. Oh no, I thought you. I thought you threw. It. Yeah, you did. You threw a plasma grenade at our boy. It's, it's but, hard to uh, tell sometimes, man. It is it's hard to tell friend from foe. This, this is another allegory. Like when you're so caught up in the politics of uh, the virtual world, as it were, you forget who's friend and who's foe. Like these guys are the hair. We're not heretics yet, huh? Or are we? I can't tell. 
soon. soon we will be maybe. soon. In a mission oh, or two, we will be. That's let's hope that's not. That might be symbolic too. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put that, actually. Oh my god. This is the long mission. Yeah. Huh? It is. This is this is one of the longer it's, ones, but it's a it's, it's a real epic. good one. It's pretty epic. The environments are absolutely crazy here too. Like you gotta you gotta the thing about Halo is that you won't ever much like life, actually, funnily enough, is that you won't really in like realize why people enjoy it as much as they do until you even like when you clear an area, you stop and you look up. Oh man. Gives you that perspective. And you realize like, oh, there's something going on here. Like there's somebody put a lot into this. They did. They created a scene. This is kind of what the DMT realm is like, except um, it's a little bit more disorienting. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, except for the fact there's a holy war. I mean, actually, never mind. Maybe it is like that. Oh, there's, so definitely there's a holy a war going on. And I was like, oh, no, actually, that would be that's way more relevant. That's to that. what I'm saying. No, that's how it's similar because yeah. there's holy wars going on in both of them. At least I've heard I've never done DMT. But maybe all that'll, right, that'll be right. episode 10 special, I think. Yeah, we had yeah, the episode 10 special. We do DMT. <laughs> Live. We just don't say anything and then we start laughing. I mean, it only takes 20 minutes, right? So. Yeah. I mean, it'll, it'll yeah, seem I, like an eternity to us, but. <laughs> <laughs> back, back to the episode five years later. <laughs> World of Warcraft. What a simulation that is, right? Yeah, World of, World of Warcraft. First metaverse. Is just, metaverse. It's, it's the very first metaverse. It's also just a microcosm of the social order of reality. I mean, we've talked about this many times before where it's like it has politics, which are the guilds. It has an economy with like the auction house and with the professions and everything. And it has it has all of like the makings, all of the surface level makings of a society in a way like a, of a nation oddly you know what i mean like each server is in a way there's even factions between yeah. the horde and the alliance <clears throat> there's even there, warring yeah. nations in that sense i mean not that that's one thing i kind of was hoping they were going to expand on as the game progressed but they didn't they went a more individualistic route actually with uh <coughs> the gameplay experience but i always thought the guilds the faction based dynamic was more interesting than because it was like you were part of you felt like you're contributing to a group you know <clears throat> yeah to to a, a war effort in a way where it's mm -hmm. like you were you were in a way i mean of course it's a game so it gives you selfish rewards but there was a little bit more to it there was a degree of almost like nationalism it's true. Whether you choose horde or alliance, you know it's like to this that, day the horde. Team. <clears throat> to this day, the horde tattoo proudly displayed on anyone, massive red flag. That's so true. <clears throat> and nobody so true. alliance players don't give enough of a fuck to get an alliance tattoo. That's why they're cooler. It's That's not because so the alliance is made up of cooler races than the horde. Nothing like that. It's just because alliance players are low key. They're not like fucking weirdos. Alliance players, look, we're the paladins. Look, we're the holy warriors. We're the best. We know that we're the best. They're kind of based. Alliance is based. Off. Alliance is based. Yeah. I'm just going to say. We know we're the good guys. The good guys always win. We don't have to show it off. I used to, I, This is so funny. I uh, <clears throat> This is totally bringing back memories. The first way I got introduced to WoW, and I'm going to want you to tell me your story too of how you got into it. <clears throat> but the way I got into World of Warcraft was that my oldest brother would be sitting in my uh, parents' room at the time using our family com computer, and I saw him playing this game a lot that I had never seen before, and he was super absorbed in it. He would just be playing for hours every day, <clears throat> any chance he could get, and I would sit by him and watch him, and I was so fascinated because as I would learn, like, all these people running around on the screen with their names, they were all different players, in they were real all real time. people, yeah. And that was so, and then you had these environments that are like, this sort of like, Stranglethorn Vale really stood out to me as like this uh, jungle, you know, by the by the coast and like there's boats Vietnam going. Vietnam of wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he would get, you know, there'd be people attacking him and sometimes he'd be in a party with people and it was like, whoa, like this is, and you gotta remember, this is back in, when I was first watching, this would have been like 2005 or six. I started playing in 2007 uh, as just a little bit as a kid back then in middle school. I didn't really get super deep into it, probably for the best, until later on in high school. But 
it was uh, it was just unlike anything else, and it, and and it really took off because it was well designed. It was community oriented. It was interesting. It was this other world with. I mean, yeah. I mean, why don't you tell me about your experience with it? But I think you can see where I'm coming from with how. Yes, absolutely. Here, let me actually let me take a second. Just one second, real quick. I'm gonna I'm actually go for it. I'm gonna pour myself a glass of wine. That's a good good move, actually. Well, sums up. Uh, so for me. WoW is actually really, it was quite near and dear to my heart. And I honestly regret never having made a video on it because uh, the way that I got into WoW was I was a little kid and uh, this was actually during uh, Classic. Uh, this is when this was happening. I was real young. I was real young. For reference, I'm 22 right now. And I mean, if you can, you can work backwards through the timeline and figure out how that worked out. But uh, my dad, when I was young, was a very busy guy, and it's not that I didn't know my dad or anything, but I feel like I, I never really got to talk to him, talk to him, like, properly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I always would see my dad playing this game, and I would sit and watch him and stuff, and I, I'd, like, talk to him, and then eventually, I think it was probably around, like, probably around, like, six? It was around, like, like TBC time. Like, it was, it was probably right before TBC. And I finally got a subscription of my own. And I ended up playing WoW with my dad and his high school friends, basically, that still had, like, kept in contact. And I got into it. I started leveling. And, like, my dad was, like, probably, like, level, I think, like, I, I think when I start, I got into it, my dad was, like, level 55. And this is actually a funny story. I think this is the first time I've ever told this, but I, my dad and I actually talk about this story pretty regularly. But by the time that I got to around level 30, like I was kind of like leveling on my own. He kind of showed me how to play the game and I picked it up pretty quickly. By the time I was level 30, uh, my dad was probably like level, he didn't play it that much, but like he'd like pop on and stuff. He was probably like level 57, 58. He was doing quests in so you were catching up. Eastern. Yeah, I was I was catching up. I definitely <laughs> played it a lot more because I was a kid. And also, I mean, it's easier to level up when you're level up, you're lower level. You know what I mean? Right. right. And uh, my dad and his friends were questing in uh, Western and Eastern Plaguelands, and like they were kind of like at the end game of Classic. You know right, what I mean? Right. That's like upper level fifties. Yeah, yeah, late like late fifties areas. And, and it takes I a while was, to ground out levels at that at that range too. <clears throat> yeah. And I, I was a dwarf hunter, actually. And I, I regretted being a hunter because I don't like that class a lot. But huh. I I had just I had just gotten I, I just got it because I like guns. But uh that shows you how completely deep the gun reasonable. Thing goes with me. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's, I was like seven years old and I was choosing that or whatever. But um It was meant to be. I, I I just, I remember I had just gotten my level one mount or whatever, like my tier one mount, which is like the whatever 60% speed boost ram. And they were questing in Western Plaguelands, I think. It was actually, hilariously, I was talking the about this, my favorite, <laughs> Yeah, the ram. The ram and, yeah. and they were they were questing right by, and I remember exactly where this happened. And hilariously, I didn't know who this character was at this point, but it ended up being my favorite WoW character is uh, Uther, the, the mm. Uther Lightbringer. Mm-hmm. And I the rode lightning. my ram all the way north from, I think, the probably the most northern place that I had discovered was Arathi Highlands. And still, I rode still a my few ram. states away. <clears throat> yeah, quite a few states away. And I rode my ram from Arathi Highlands up to Uther's tomb in Western Plaguelands. And that was about where I met them. Because, like, we were in a party and I could see them on the map, right? right. And... Just, I didn't say anything. Like, we were all in, like, a call or whatever, like a team speaker of Ventrilo or whatever we were using at the time. And How old were you again during this? I was, like, seven, Jesus. probably. okay. But I was, okay. like, I'm going to be honest. I've always been the same as I am now. So basically, just imagine me today, but, like, significantly dumber and with a really high-pitched voice. But I was still a hey pretty reasonable Hey, guys, I'm going to meet you at Uther's tomb. No, that's what I was going to say is I never said anything because I, I was smart enough for that. Incredibly based. You know Incredibly. what I mean? See, I was, I was I just, a loudmouth at that age, so. Mm. No, I, I, that's the thing is I was honestly, I was, I was really quiet until probably like end of high school. 
really. Did you like, experience I, I always, getting bullied online? I was the online? strong, silent type. For your voice? Oh, I can get... I, I can get to that actually. I, that happened okay. to me with WoW actually. Yeah. We'll get but, to that um, later, but yeah, continue the story. <clears throat> I, yeah, I rode my ram from Arathi Highlands to Western Plaguelands and just never said anything. And in As the one does. Of, yeah, in the middle of a fight that they were they were just like whatever grinding mobs, probably mining some mithril or whatever. And I just oh. I just rocked up on my ram, dropped off the ram, started taking pot shots to the level fifty mobs, and. Uh, What's funny is it, that was like, I feel like in a weird way, that was like when I proved myself huh. where like they used to kind of like go and like level without me because I was like a lower level. But like from then on, like we just kind of all stuck together. That's awesome. And I really feel like I got to know my dad and I, I to this day have a very, very good relationship with my dad. I talk to him all the time and I feel like that was really when that started was, uh, and then, like, it just kind of, like, w I was, like, part it of the Proved you could hang you know with the I mean? big boys. Yeah, exactly. And, like, I would stay alive. And my dad played uh, Paladin. And, uh, and then I, when Classic came out, I ended up playing Paladin like my father uh, before me. Like Uther before and, you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny because to this day, Paladin's my favorite class, like, by far. Like, right. it's, it's definitely, like, all of the abilities just, like, suit what I want to do with you the game. You are kind but, of a uh, Paladin. A little bit. A little bit. I think I'm more but, of a Druid. You are. You're Even a druid though, or a shaman, for sure. <laughs> it's funny how the classes are kind of like... The personality types. types, for sure. That's going to be the new... Uh, I mean, they were pretty on point with uh, a lot of things with WoW to make it like very in a very uh, relatable or identifiable game, I would say. like the Even what you just described with this, uh, this journey to meet your dad and his friends in the party, I mean, the world really felt like... That's what fascinated me above everything was the fact that there was this massive world that at first, you know, before you know about everything, because there's no instant access to all the databases, at least there wasn't for me. I mean, you had. And yeah, when I was playing, there was there was not like there was Wowhead where you could get like info on like drops and stuff, but there wasn't like nothing like there is today for games, you know. It was just such an immersive experience. It almost It's almost like the modern day or that time period's version, for a kid at least, of like exploring the world, which is something mm -hmm. that used to be a thing, obviously, way back. But there is a sort of part of, I don't know, maybe girls can't relate as much. I think this might be even more of a masculine urge, if you will, to like explore and like venture out into the, I mean, girls can do it too. Of course they can. But it's just that that drive to venture out into the unknown and like, whoa, like there's this whole world out there and you don't know who you can meet, what, what's going on. And it was, I guess, the that, that inherent risk taking. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. You just you just um, what's over the next hill? What's over the next hill? You know what I mean? And yeah. the camaraderie and like, of being in a party, of being a part of a group. I mean, it facilitated that even with it could strengthen your friendships and your relationships in that way, too. Absolutely. And that, that was that was actually what I was going to get to right there was like, and then after that, like when we started leveling together and everything, by the time that I got to 60 and everything, I actually ended up, uh, that there was like a while in between where like there was TBC and I don't really remember what happened with that. I remember that right when LK came out, I actually rolled a death knight and I remember using the death knight a lot and we would, uh, we would actually three men run me my dad and his like best friend from high school, we would three man run a dungeon called the Culling of Strathholm, which is to to this day my favorite dungeon. That is in a WoW. great dungeon. That is a great dungeon. I yeah. know exactly the and one. I, and I always wanted uh, Baron Rivendare's mount. We we used to run that dungeon multiple times, like every night, and we would just grind it for like the rare drops in there because there was like the purple sword, uh, whatever Rivendare's rune blade. I remember I had that. And uh, it was like a purple. And that was just, I have so many good memories of that dungeon. I know that dungeon like the back of my hand. I'm like a, I'm like a Culling of Stratholme speedrunner. We used to three-man it, and you're supposed to have five people. And we were all like on or slightly below level for it. And we were just like, the, the teamwork that we were doing was just so good that we would, we would do it. You know what I mean? With just three people. And it would, it would work. Because, because my dad was a paladin, <laughs> so he could heal. And then like... Uh, it was my dad's friend, Rob, was his name. And uh, he was a warlock, so he had really good damage over time and stuff. And, like, I balanced it out with, like, the melee DPS, and it all just worked out. I was, like, an off-tank. And it was, it, was, it was so cool. You know what I mean? Like, it was just a great fucking time. 
But uh, oh you know, yeah, <laughs> I remember you. You were really into classic. You made it to like level sixty. I didn't quite make it that far. I was really busy with work, but yeah. Well, that's why I stopped is because um, oh, two reasons. One, you know, as you get older, you just get more busy with real life things. I guess uh, obviously, and that's just a thing with the games in general. But something about WoW that I really dislike is that well, it's kind of like some things about the way civilization is in reality that I don't like, which is that everything is over time with wow has become so reduced to a formula to a determined outcome. So detached from actually being immersed in the game, from actually experiencing it and enjoying it with fresh eyes. Like I did as a kid, where it's just like, I don't know exactly what I'm doing even, but like I'm probably doing half the things wrong, but it's so fun to just fun that way. It's so fun to figure it out, you know? A trial and error. It's it's very much like real life. And I feel like that's what made classic so much better than than what retail ended up becoming is that it was it was so ex- like you by playing it, you were just always experimenting. And that was the thing with it's why we played Strathalm so much was that it was like you, you never really knew what was going to happen. Right. You know what I mean? Like there, there was every run was kind of different. Right. And you didn't know all the formulas and all the strategies and all the the secret, like efficient things to do to keep, I mean, you knew some things from that you picked up that you heard and maybe you even had your own secret strategies, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like this script that you were following, which now when you play, wow, it's like, there's this determined script that everybody knows that's op. That's the optimal way to play a dungeon or a raid or a this or that. It's like a rhythm game. It's less like like an immersive thing where like you're fighting for your life it's more of like i do this at this time and it works and and the that like first era of there being a lot of gray area a lot of confusion a lot of not not confusion just like inexperienced people it made it so much easier to meet other players because you'd actually have a functional reason to interact and communicate with them because it's like hey do you know what this is or like do you know how to do this or like "Hmm, i don't know let's do you want to help me with this thing or like, can I help you with this thing? Or what are you up to over there? Like you just run into people and you'd be more sociable because you're both kind of exploring this world together, this game together. You both have value to give each other. There, there's like a yeah. sort of like mutual, there, there's a symbiosis, you know, and that's what guilds were. And that's what like, and raids were like the ultimate example of that. And that, that actually gets into me being uh, hit, hit for my voice okay, go online. For Where uh, this is actually like, this is like my single most traumatic gaming memory. And I actually can't believe that I'm publicly, I don't think I've ever talked about this publicly before because I'm honestly kind of ashamed of it. But I remember that I was putting together. Name the raid. Name the raid so I can find it. I was going to say, yeah, look it up. Uh, It was Nax Ramus 10 man. It was a Nax 10 man during during LK. Um, I put together a 10 man nax and if i remember correctly i just like i was probably like eight or nine or something and i didn't like fully understand how it works i was probably like like relatively newly level 80 i was probably rocking few purples mostly blues i put together this group it was like i remember it was winter how did you how did you put together the group though through the guild through (laughs) trade chat what just lfg basically like we had a guild like my dad had a guild and it, but everybody so mostly random people though mostly random people yeah and everyone was everyone in, like, i'm gonna go in a little bit a little sidebar real quick but everybody in our guild was so fucking cool and if there is a small chance that this person sees this video if they do we might have to cut this out because i don't know if this is gonna like somehow dox my old wow character or no, something don't worry like, about it. Able to, but uh there was somebody in our guild named marlboro girl and she was so fucking nice to me. We did arenas together and like she knew I was like a little kid and she oh, just like she was your little wow girlfriend. Was, no, no, no. It wasn't like that. It was more like my wow older sister. Okay. And like she just she was just so nice to me. Like she just completely entertained me. I remember that like our our um our guild or not our guild, our arena name was Horde Kills. But nice. like spelled completely wrong, but it was like, it was like deliberately ironic. You Did know you have I mean? a crush but on like, her? Was, no, I didn't. But 
she was just like she was probably like honestly my my first online friend but she was always just like super cool and nice to me and stuff and like we just had a great time we do arenas together and i probably suck dick but Damn. It, was, it was always fun and and uh but anyway I remember I put together this group of like randoms to do this 10 man of Nax because I really wanted uh, the one sword from Nax. And I remember, I think I wanted to add my dad to the raid because like I felt bad that I'd, I'd already gotten like 10 people and he had like just gotten on. And so like I added him and then somehow somebody was like oh like give me group leader like i want to add my friend and i was like oh like of course and like i had worked in this like all day getting this group together right mm -hmm. and i gave this person a uh, group leader they immediately kicked me oh no and it i was so fucking gutted oh no that's right like man. i was so, like what i'm saying is this is this is like I'm telling you something that happened like 14 years ago in a video game, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, and I was just tell like, me where you were in the world of Warcraft. Shit. Like, what do you remember visually? I was where in you Dalaran. Were? Okay, as one is, of course. At this time, I was in Dalaran, and I was. Uh, <laughs> I remember when I got kicked. I was in the fucking smithy shop in Dalaran. <laughs> It's isn't it so funny how you can recall the exact location? That's why WoW is such yep. a good simulation because you can. I remember I was. That's what I'm saying. It's like it was. It's so like it's oddly vivid. Real. It's it and, is. And I was. I remember I was in the smithy shop because if you guys, are, if if people watching this remember, the armor that you got at the beginning of LK was a uh, fucking what's his name Darius Mograine or Darian Mograine, whatever his name was. It was his armor and it was sick. It was like the skull helmet right, with the right, horns, right, yeah. the open jaw. Sick. Yeah, and I wanted that shit so bad. And I remember I was in there looking at it when I got kicked, and I was like, oh. "Fuck!" Like it just it gutted me so hard. I I didn't do a raid for a really long time. Did you uh, after that? But cry? Did you get angry? Oh, I teared up, but I didn't yeah. like sob or anything. But I just remember being like, it was hard, more of like yeah. one of those things that like when you're a kid where you're like, I just worked so hard for that. Right. It's like someone destroyed your sandcastle, essentially. That's that is the best way to put it. Like as an and also like Except it's the sandcastle of people you've I, gathered, so it's even harder yeah. than grains of sand to compile. Exactly. To and it was it was like it just felt so cool that I actually like got a raid together as like a fucking as seven the leader. Or eight year old. As yeah, the and I was like exactly and you was gave like, oh, it I'm up. Not that, see, that was yeah, a lesson like, in... I trusted in, uh, somebody. Ooh, I trusted somebody else. They betrayed your like trust. Yep. That seems to be a theme with you. Yeah, it does. That happens to me a lot. I trust people a little bit too much sometimes, but... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, but that, was, that was my yeah. traumatic wow story. It's uh, That is the first time... That is the first time I have ever spoken of that since that happened if i'm being totally honest with you and i remember my dad just like left the group and we like ran a dungeon together or something and it was okay like, fine but hey my I'll, dad's a good dad but that's an that's an awesome story i uh, i'll do you one similar yeah i was gonna say i'm sure that you have something similar i'm sure that you do because here's the thing wow is so it's it lends itself so well at least back then it did to creating these kinds of memorable stories because it was kind of the conduit that a lot of my internet first internet experiences social experiences and relationships even uh you know not all of them but like a certain swath of them definitely started from wow but anyways um <clears throat> i'll tell you this speaking of online relationships uh ooh this yeah this okay i'm gonna keep all the names out of this okay because this is also something i've never told publicly actually mm. so i'm being a little bit uh risk i mean whatever it's not really risky it's just uh it's a little bit of a private thing i've, I've not shared it too much but i'm gonna keep all the names out of it um this was not that long ago but pretty long ago that i think it's okay to say this was 2014 so i was already 19 at the time i was already uh sort of an adult. But as I said, I got into WoW, really actually got into it in my like last couple of years of high school because I played it as a kid in middle school a little bit. I watched my brother play, but I kind of, uh, he kind of cut me off from it actually, maybe for my own good, I don't know, but he kind of, uh, you know, severed my connection, my access to the WoW computer. The metaverse. 
to the metaverse yeah. essentially he unplugged me he forcefully ejected me from the wow matrix but anyways i got back into it in uh towards the end of my high school and uh so 2014 uh i'm already by this point like doing arena and stuff pvp Oh God, this is so re- this is too recent that it's almost okay. But I'm, it leads basically. I had started a stream on Twitch, and I was not very popular. I'd get like you know, I had like forty viewers, maybe you know, and like I had just turned, I had just gotten a webcam, which I was pretty like averse to just getting. enough viewers to have like the chat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I had like a yeah. chat room going, which was nice. And uh, anyways, this. Uh, person messages me in game whispers me old school uh the original form of twitter dms yeah exactly whispers were like that's the original it goes down in the dms truly (laughs) yep uh you know whispers were an art form you know um but this girl messages me and uh kind of like gives me a compliment you know and then we start hitting it off from there whispering back and forth because I guess she had seen my stream or something. Mm, she thought you were cute. I think so. And I was, I, I don't even, again, like I was completely a virgin in every sense of the word back then too. So like, I'm not very smooth with women at this, at this time. Um, but obviously now I have it all figured out, but back then, you know, and I, so I was hitting it off with this girl and, uh, Oh man, dude, this gets so, I don't know if I want to continue with this. Uh, okay. I will. I'm just going to, if I want to cut it, we'll cut it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. no worries. I'm hanging off with this girl. She's very shy. She doesn't really, um, we had Skype at the time is like the platform that one uses outside of wow. And there was always something, it was like Ventrilo before that. Um, there was like something called raid calls. There's all these like auxiliary platforms that go with a game like wow but skype was the one at the time of this era that we were using after that it was like i guess discord or some shit i don't know what they do now i don't play anymore but uh we exchange we got i got her on skype basically and um this girl lived in another country but we quickly got to knowing each other and we really hit it off and we were kind of making loose plans to see each other. Mm. And uh, I was really into this girl. I'm just going to say that, you know, I was again, like I was 19 or maybe I turned 20 by the time I was like really talking with her and it was strange. It was like the first real online relationship, really the only, I would say, online relationship I've been in uh if that's what you would even call it because it was someone who I like I wasn't with physically at all um but it was just almost like this this you know conceived person in my head because I only got bits and pieces of them like through photos we would talk on the on the on Skype for a long time we would uh you know I, I don't even remember if we played that much together actually but uh we would just we met over wow and uh see now it's like this is getting away from wow this is just turning into a personal story about an online relationship but it no, taught but me I mean, something it, it starts the metaverse it starts the metaverse because this well this is actually i guess a good topic in that sense because it's like this transcended wow any i i've definitely had like friendships and stuff but this was a sort of relationship that wasn't even really based in wow anymore it just started there and even me streaming was this thing that was extrapolated from WoW because I would only stream WoW, but it's you know we we've been extending this simulation outwards is what I'm saying, and I guess I'll continue with the relationship for now so you could see where it ended. But what happened was <laughs> without I'll, I'm going to leave some of the details out, but uh, essentially I had this I had this best friend at the time. This guy I'd always play arena with. I'd always, uh, I would talk with a lot. Uh, good friend of mine, Guildmate. Um, same server. I kind of looked up to him a little bit. He was uh, similar. He was also a hunter. I was playing hunter at the time. Uh, 
Ah, I, I had a feeling that you were a fellow hunter. I, I was. I was known to dabble in the heart hunting arts. But this guy was kind of my hunting mentor, if you would, at, at ver- at the, in the very early days. Your Jaeger Meister. My hunting buddy, if you would. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> anyways, turns out he was hunting for the same mm. prize as me. Mm. And this guy was very uh, charismatic, funny. Uh, he was more mature than me. He was older than me. I was a young lad. And this woman... Would you say you were a young buck? I was a young buck, but I was not ready to take on a woman as complicated and honestly sophisticated as her. She was like 22 or 23 at the time. So she was like two or three years older than me. And in those years, that's a long time, I feel like, because you're, Yeah, I was a late bloomer too, I would say. I mean, I guess I'm still sort of learning. Uh, everyone is to some extent, but I was, uh, I probably had like the social intelligence, especially having grown up around games a lot of like a 15, 14 year old, despite being like 14. Cause the first time I really got drunk, I was like 20. And a lot of people I know it's like, they were like 16 or 17, you know? So the point is I, I was just socially behind and what ended up happening is I kind of fucked up on some things with her. I mean, I, I didn't, I was never ill intentioned, but like she misread something I did and yada, yada, yada. It was, uh, it was a little bit of a, touchy situation but i really was head over heels for this girl i thought she was really interesting really cute really attractive in all the right kinds of ways very independent it makes it all the more difficult when you're that into somebody exactly and i felt so heartbroken over this this thing i'd done and i had my friend who was older wiser smoother than me help me out and i introduced him to her earlier because he was my best friend and so she knew of him and so he helped me with this difficult situation. And then I kind of smoothed things out, smoothed things out with her, but not really because it Mm. wasn't long after that, that things sort of became cold and it was probably partially my bad because I was again, just a young inexperienced kid at the time. But what ended up happening as I came to find out, find out is that he and her, my best friend, my hunting buddy, had mm-hmm. been talking, had been hanging out, enjoying each other's company, and uh, he kind of just came clean to me one of the days. I was like in a Skype call, and I remember like not fully even processing it. I was just like, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah. I was like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, that's cool. That's how I'd react to that, too, is I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I was like, yeah, oh, are you hanging out with them? Oh, that's, no, that's fine. Like, I totally, you know, and I just didn't even process it. And then it, because of that, it kind of came out and like, I mean, I didn't do anything, but I was just kind of like distant from him after that. And it was just, uh, I mean, we, we, you know, I essentially lost the person I love and my best friend because they got with each other. They ended up getting married. They ended up, uh, no see, yeah, man, she ended up moving in with him, uh, it was heavy stuff, you know, and it was like I was truthfully in love with this girl. She called me when she called me and like wanted to end things. Um, I found out about that they were talking to each other after supposedly it was after they broke. Uh, she broke up with me, but I think I think they kind of were doing it before, but I don't care. I mean, it was they were probably like a little flirtation ship type thing. Yeah, you know it's, I mean? like, it, yeah, it happens. It's an online relationship. OK, that's what I'm that's the key to keep in mind here but she called me and it was like this this other skype call and i was like i was basically i was crying i was crying like as i figured out i was like oh but we'll we'll still be friends right and she's like i don't know i'll think about it (laughs) and then Ah. yeah not not great and then uh i didn't even contact her i just kept her as a as a contact on skype but after a month of not even messaging her she uh i think either blocked me or deleted me or something and uh and well the rest is history i guess but uh you know that's the thing i don't like about the metaverse let me put it to you this way the fact that you can build up these strong emotions about someone 
and maybe even build up this fantasy about them and then have your heart broken and then they're yep. just gone. They're just a void. They're just never it's seen. It's as them though again. they never existed. Yes. So you just tuck that away. That you know, that's it's just such a strange fleeting it, it's really one of those things that you repress. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you you try to forget it. And I, I, I know exactly what you mean. And I mean we've spoken about this before about how like the internet has a habit of making people disposable. Mm-hmm. And dating apps that, that, that's exactly what dating yes. apps do yes exactly it's it's that sort of thing where uh people just it's not like living in a town with somebody or something where like no. you, you know them and see them in real life it's like when they're gone they're gone and it's just like it, it's like um it's, it's like oh hey buddy sorry the cat just approached it's, uh, he knew that I needed he comfort knew, right now. Yeah, but um, it, it's almost like they just fade away into the ocean. You know what I mean? Like they just mm. dissolve. I know. I, I feel, and I, in a very literal way, I feel like a lot of my wow friends, I mean, some of them, I, I, I don't even know. Like I, I don't, I guess I could say I know some of them tangentially from like Twitter or whatever in some sort of disconnected, strange way still. But for the most part, like I also, I'm pretty detached from a lot of people I spent a decent amount of time with in, uh, in online games in general. Like even, I remember, uh, before wow, I was playing halo or maybe it was after wow. I was playing halo on, uh, Xbox a lot, you know, halo three with my friends, uh, local friends, but sometimes I would make friends over halo and I don't, you know, honestly keep up with any of those people. I don't have no idea where they are, where they went or anything. Sometimes I think about them though. Oh. Like, Oh, I remember this guy's name. I remember I played with, for some reason I remember, I remember this random guy named moon the first guy I ever matched with in halo three on snowbound. And he was like some Irish yep. guy. Yeah. But we all have a person like that. Who is just like this, right? Like, yes. you know, I was going to say, can I tell you a story? Please. This, this is honestly, this is the first instance of anything traumatic in my life. Honestly, uh, this was ahead. like before my mom got cancer or anything, right? This is actually right before that. I remember okay. I was I was about six years old, and this was right after the Xbox 360 had come out. This was right when I was playing Halo Three, uh, or I might I might have been seven actually. This might have been like around the WoW time actually, when. Uh, but I got into Halo Three, my first ever online friend actually. Now that I remember was this guy named Chris and he had an account that he shared with his brother. Surely we're going to play a Halo 3 mission as you say. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm going to have to back out of this, this mission real quick because it auto plays the next one. But, oh, gotcha. uh, while, while we figure this out, I'll start telling the story, but I'll actually, let me go into detail about this actually, because Chris fucking deserves it. He was a fucking legend. And I actually like, I still think about this guy regularly. Like whenever, honestly, whenever I fire up Halo 3, I think about this guy. Damn. Because, because he was, uh, when I, when I started playing Halo 3, like, like th this is, I don't know if, if people watching the show are going to know about this about me, but Halo was like, like the very first game that I properly played. My dad got me on Halo C when I was, uh, let's play the last mission. Okay. Um, Nice. My dad got me on Halo C when I was uh, three years old, and he let me play. I remember I came into his office, and I said, uh, I want to play. Like, you know, it's like a three-year-old would say. And he, he sat me down, and he let me play. And nice. I'm very grateful to him for doing that. But <laughs> the first time I ever really got to play Halo online with a friend of mine was uh, Chris. When I, I met him just over Xbox Live, just in a game. Just we a like random game. Image. Yeah, just a random game. I think I remember it was uh it was that one map with like the flood stuff on it, but it's kind of green. You know what I mean? Oh, uh had, like, you're talking about isolation. Yes, yes, isolation. Good map. And that was where I met him. And Chris and I used to like after school, we'd always get on and play together. And uh Dude, let's do multiplayer. You think no, I was gonna say I think the last mission could be banger though. Okay, let's do like, the last mission. Let's do the last mission. Yeah. And it's not that long either. It's just the Warthog run is such is, good footage is, too is, in the background. Is, is. Sorry, continue, uh, continue. Uh Chris 
and I used to play after school like every day. And like I would just like he was so reliable. Like I would I would always just play with Chris. Like I always knew he was gonna be on. And he was like the only person I'd really play with. We might have had like one other person that we would we would play with like in our party, but they weren't like a really like a regular. And I remember that his account name, and I, I maybe I'll have to cut this out, but I'm not sure. Uh, his account name was Q and Chris, and that was because him and his brother Quentin would share an account. And uh, they would play like, uh, I think his brother would play like Gears of War and like shit like that. And, As brothers uh, did, share accounts. Yeah, like his older brother was was named Quentin. I didn't really talk to Quentin much. Like I was kind of like intimidated by him <laughs> just because he was so much older. But like he was a cool guy. Like it was, it was never mean or anything. But right, right. Um, Chris and I used to play together all the time for like a few hours after school. And then I remember at one point like we were supposed to play and then just Chris never got on. Hmm. And like he just the account was offline for like two or three weeks and Chris just never got on. And I was like, what's going on? And then finally, like a month later, I saw the account online and it was it was playing Gears and I messaged and I was like, hey, like you want to play some Halo 3, Chris? And and I got like a like an invite to like whatever, like an Xbox Live party or whatever. And I joined and it was Quentin. And Quentin told me, like, hey, like, I don't really know how to tell you this, but, and, like, I could tell that he was kind of, like, choked up, and he was like, Chris died in a car accident. Oh, my God. And, yeah. I just, I'd never spoke to the guy again, obviously. But that was, he was my first online friend, and he just died. Wow. That's... And I just didn't really know how to deal with it at the time. And it honestly, like, that's what I'm saying. It's like, how do you deal with that at all? It's... Right now, that's what I'm saying. It's like, even playing this mission right now, I'm, I, I think of him every time I play this mission. Wow. That's heavy stuff. I, but... I mean, it's, well, it's, it's heavy because it's like how, it's not even heavy. It's not the right word. It's like, because uh, this is such a, it's... It's so detached from reality, and yet you shared so many, so many memories, so much time with him, even though you yeah, never met the guy. You I mean. never even met yeah, the guy. Yeah, like I, I never, I never knew what he looked like. I never met him. But like we just, we spent a hell of a lot of time together. Right. You know, it's like, and I, I just, uh, and like, and that's what counts. Ultimately, I think that's, time. that's exactly, and that, that's the thing that makes me sad. Honestly, is that I never got to meet him, mm. and like it just kind of. Even, I'm sure that you can tell right now. Like it's, it's a weird thing to get upset over, but even just talking about it, like it, it still kind of upsets Th me. There's a sort like, of inconclusiveness to it. Yeah, you never and like and like I I feel really sad that like I never got like I, I was too young, but like I just never got to tell him how much like that meant to me. Right. Because like I had I had no I had nobody else that like did that stuff with me, and it was it was good to have like a friend to do stuff with, and he was he was a really cool guy. Like. We like we never fucking argued or anything, you know what I mean? Like we just we had a fucking always just had a great time. It was like every time I get home from school, we'd fucking jump on some Halo Three. We'd have a great time. We wouldn't think about anything. It was just it was it was great. And uh, rest in peace, Chris. You know what I mean? Like that's that's all I can say. You know, Look it's like he was, he, was, he was a great kid. Okay. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful skybox. Chris is out there somewhere. And Chris is out there somewhere. Chris is out there somewhere lasering my fucking warthog with a Spartan <laughs> laser by accident. <laughs> like he is. I just I remember that so vividly. That was like one of my first uh my first like multiplayer gaming memories that I remember is the uh, with him accidentally hitting me with the Spartan laser and the warthog <laughs> and me just like laughing so hard. But he it's... he was a great guy and I, I just remember that was honestly probably the first time that I properly like as like an like a seven year old or whatever confronted my mortality. Where it was like, I mean, like it, it could have just as easily been me, right? You know what I mean, and like, like even like that. I think that's that's part of probably why I still think about him so much is like everything that's happened in my life since then, like just never happened, and it could have been Chris instead, you know, like right? Because we we were very like I mean obviously I mean you guys were age, similar. You guys were we were very similar. We're like your I, friends, I wouldn't doubt that. And he's just I, gone. I wouldn't he's doubt for a second day. that what exactly like I wouldn't doubt for a second that he would have gotten into YouTube and stuff too. He was a real creative kid and like right. everything. It was like he could have been living the life you're living right now. Exactly. Like he very he very much just as easily could have been me. 
like today. You know what I mean? Like, they say people in your life are seasons. Did they say that? What does that mean? I don't know. That's from a Kanye song. But what I'm trying to say is that's that... That's not like something Kanye would say. People are... Uh, they're different... Well, we're all just different paths of consciousness. So he oh, I is, definitely believe that. In, yeah. a, in a very real sense, Chris is just you in a different set of circumstances. Yeah. I mean, we are I, that's all honestly, Chris. Like, that's the thing. Yeah. We're all Chris. I was going to say Online. that there's definitely been... There's definitely been a few moments, and I don't mean to like misuse his memory or whatever, but there's definitely been like a few moments in like my my like the online stuff that I've done where I've been faced with a really hard decision. I think like, what would that guy have wanted me to do? You know what I mean? Like, damn. But it's that it's that's the th that's the beauty of it. You, he lives on through that in, in a sense, in the sense that you value you, you remember him. Absolutely. He lives on through your memory, through your, I guess you're you hold a place for him in your mind still lives on through oh, you i mean that's yeah. one way to say it and through whoever else you know his family his, his friends anyone he's impacted yeah I've, I've honestly thought where like I, i've really thought that i was like i should probably try and now that like I'm, I'm blessed with the ability of like having a twitter and stuff like that i have reach and everything where it's like you could contact I've his definitely, family. I've definitely thought about being like, if anybody knows a guy named Quentin who used to have the gamer tag Q and Chris, mm. uh, hit me up. Man. Because I would definitely love to talk to his brother and be like, hey, like your brother had a really big impact on me. You know what I mean? Like That'd be awesome. I think that'd mean a lot to him and to you. It would just be a great connection. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, like, that that's like what we're talking about with the metaverse and everything. We haven't even gotten to really like the true negative of it. But like, that is the positive of the internet to me. Where We've been like, talking about a lot of the positives, but yeah, at the same time, funny. there's negatives all throughout what we've been saying, too. Very true. The fact that you just have this almost, not you specifically, but that there's instances where you could just have this. I guess both of our stories are like this. There's this sort of, I don't want to say it's not closure. Loss. It's just this yeah. like void of emotion in a way. I, I don't know. I mean, you can make sense of it, but what I'm trying to say I, is I really that, think that, th that humans weren't built for that. Yeah. Like in a, in a sense, you know what I mean? When I've never like, met this person that I had some feelings for that I thought I loved, however real that may or may not have been, but I felt some some intense feelings for this person. And you felt you know, more kinship, friendship with this person. And in a, in a, I might even say, yeah, it was and, like, yeah. And they're both just gone from our lives forever in different ways. But nonetheless, they were both people we never even really met, but we still had some abstract attachment to. Exactly. And that, that, that's like the tragedy of it is that we never really got to meet them. But I mean, I guess the blessing of it is that we got to speak to them. You know, it's like, yeah, it's... It is that. It is that. You're right. Because the essence of a human is still understood in in these cases, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, not, not to bring it back to me, but I'm going to bring it back to me for a second, where it's like the... Um, <laughs> I honestly think that that's probably why I have, in addition to the fact that my dad introduced me to it when I was young, but uh, I think that's part of why I have, particularly to Halo 3, such an attachment to it. You know what I mean? Is it's like it, like in a, in a weird way, like when that happened, I feel like that was oddly, like I mean, I was really young, but it was still like that was the end of my childhood, really. Wow. Or like I wow. started to understand what what the real world was, and I, in a weird way, my last memory of childhood is Halo Three. It died with Chris. Chris was your did no, it child. really did. There is that. That's ah, oh, I, I that's such a great way of putting it because. There is this sort of point in a, a gamer's life, if you will, where one has to put down the controller and realize there are greater responsibilities there's, to there's bear. There's more at stake. There's more yeah. at stake. You know, we both, I think we both enjoy games, but we're not, I th games are just this fun little it's distraction. It's a fun thing for us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not a, it used to be for me as when I was a kid, I was like, Oh man, like that's what I'm Ooh. looking forward to going home towards was for the game, you know? Oh, I wish we watched the cutscene. It's actually a good one. Yeah, I was gonna say, here, I, let's just die. Yeah, let's just die. 
Oh, actually, I'll just respawn. Actually, I think I think we're actually fucked. I didn't get the laser. I don't know if oh, you wait, have it. Wait, I have a. I don't think we can kill him. I ran out of rockets. I ran out of rockets. I shot them in the grave mine cutscene. Yeah, I, I shot all my rockets at him. I think we. I think we just gotta die. Actually, It'd be funny if we just. Sometimes you gotta die clearly. to truly live. Oh, definitely. But not literally die. I'm talking about, you know. Oh shit! Yeah, if we don't have the laser, what the fuck? Wait, we're just stuck in a time loop now. Are you serious? Oh wait, actually, actually, the rockets are hurting, and we just gotta be judicious with our rockets. I just ran out again. Oh no! I think the mission is fucked. Wait, no. Unless, we, this, unless my sentinel beam thing is. We have to him. beat the AI. This is the challenge. That's what. Yeah, well, this is metaphorical, isn't? This is so symbolic. It Holy really shit. is because the oracle is essentially AI. Oh my god, I fucking, I fucked him off. And Master Chief is essentially... Uh, dude, I defeated the AI. You I'm did? sorry, Johnson, but I, I have to... Uh, okay, I got it. I didn't yeah, get a I, shot I of it. The AI. I'm, I'm waiting to respawn here, you're not safe. I got him now. I, I fucking, I, I fragged him and it made him fuck off and then I grabbed Johnson's laser. They you said. learned that day that people don't respawn in real life. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it, honestly, where it's like he's never coming back. Oh, my God. Speaking of never coming back. So uh, yeah, this is back. right here. I'm Master Chief and Johnson is Chris. <laughs> it's so accurate. Oh, my God. I'm going to say something real retarded right now. Uh, because I know that Master Chief is considered a faceless protagonist and everything, and I grew up playing the franchise, whatever, but genuinely, I relate to the guy. There is you know a I mean? stoic personality to Master Chief, for sure. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like People always call him a faceless protagonist, but I really don't think that he is. Like I think the fact that he says very little says a lot. Exactly. Exactly. He's a stoic. He's, he's truly a he's stoic. A stoic. Yeah. yeah. That's what he is. Say a lot without saying a lot is really his, his thing. He's a man of action. He's a man of action. Exactly. Exactly. But he knows what needs to be done. He's, he's a man of conviction, too. Yes. And probably a lot of knowledge. Uh, but he's just not a big talker. <laughs> That's, that's, I think that that's part of the reason that his uh, personality doesn't come through is that his personality is to hide his personality, really. And that's kind of what they get at in the writing is that he does have a personality, but he chooses to not. It's not even that he's hiding. I think he just has bigger priorities, you could say. Exactly. That's what I mean. It's like he chooses to not be driven by it. Right. He's got bigger things to worry about. He's got bigger fish to fry than... And he's not even quit. really worried at all. I just got killed. Yeah, he doesn't. He's not afraid. That was the sentinel I put there before, and it just shot yeah. me dead. If that's not that's symbolic. because we killed. Yeah, but that's because we killed the the monitor. Right, right, right. I, but I forgot it works because that's a piece of equipment. That's kind of funny. Yeah, it's cool that they they pay that attention. Right. Yeah. To make that like, happen. It's consistent. So now we are. God, I feel like this is where we are in uh, civilization right now, like this point of the mission. <laughs> yeah. The, it's uh, like we, we got this ridge to the one way to escape or something. Yeah. Things are fine. We got to make it out before the machines get us. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. There is a lot of universal parallels in a lot of great sci-fi stories, or I guess just stories in general, but like... You know, this might, you know, this is ostensibly a story about aliens. Like, you actually said it really well. You said it's cowboys versus aliens, right? It's cowboys and Indians is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Where, where yeah, like the, the covenant are like these, these spiritual people, and then the humans are these cowboys that come in and they want to they colonize and they want, they want the resources and they want to expand and they want industry. And then you have the, the, the Indians, which are the, these spiritual beings that want to safeguard 
these things, even even like and I'm not shitting on the Native Americans here. This is about Halo. Uh, they even though they might not necessarily understand exactly what they're doing, and I mean you could say that about the Aztecs more so than you could about any of the, the other Native Americans, where it's like they they're just sacrificing people because that's what they think their gods want. Which is exactly like all the glassings of the planets in Halo, where I see it as like the Aztec sacrifices. Mm, it's like misguided spiritualism, basically. Exactly. We're like yeah. they they wholly believe that this is what what the divine beings want, but they they're just not. In correct. a way, you know I, mean? like, I think you can draw parallels, not necessarily with the natives or the Aztec. I mean, you could draw it with the Aztecs too, but. This is a problem throughout societies of this corrupted priesthood that sort of misleads an entire country, you know, yes. society of well-intentioned that's saying, people. And that's exactly what the yeah. Arbiter found out, isn't it? Yes. It's not a, it, like even to bring it back to the Aztecs. It's not that the Aztecs were bad. It's, it's that their, their entire religious priesthood told them that the right thing to do is to sacrifice people. And we have modern day priesthoods. You don't even need to go back to the Aztecs. I, go to the I would say there's a lot of yeah. very relevant modern day examples too. <laughs> Reflections in the mycelium. But it, my the Arbiter just realized there's a giant cult and he doesn't want to be part of it. Arbiter is, exactly. he had his own free will. That's the, the thing. You know what it is? The Arbiter lived uh, Apocalypto. Exactly. Have you ever seen that movie? That is true. There's yeah. definitely parallels with uh, the ritualistic side of the covenant, let's say, the elites and the... They are even called elites. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Th this, wait, I, let me get I, this honestly, one. Get I, this one. I, oh, yeah, yeah. Good call, good call. I'll wait for you. You got the elites and you got the brutes and you got the grunts and the jackals. And it's like the jackals are, I don't know if you, I don't know. You probably know this, but do you know like the lore of the jackals? <laughs> no, 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 no. We're cutting that. We're cutting but, that. We're cutting that. No, no. The jackals are, uh, are self-interested. Like the, they don't, they don't believe in the covenant at all. They're just like, they're basically pirates. Like they're mercenaries. I see. Like the jackals basically like work for the covenant. They're not the covenant. I see. Okay. They're like, yeah, they're mercenaries. Okay. Essentially. And, and yeah. And, and like where it's like the, yeah, elites... well, every, every uh, kind of uh, faction within the covenant has their own little interests and their, their own, own little... motives. Right. Yeah. It's not even such, it's a pretty unholy union. One might even say the covenant. Yes. That's a very good way to put it. And that's kind of what the Arbiter found out. Because the, the irony is that the whole thing is predicated on holiness, on on this... False you know, prophecy. Exactly. It's it's all blasphemous. I cannot innocence. believe that I just survived that. Can you, uh, oh, can you, you pick got, me up? Let me see if I can. Oh, oh, shit. I don't know if I can make it. Let me see. Uh, I'm going to try. Wait. Where did you go? Where are you going? You're going Probably under. I got, I, got to, I got to go back here to get up here. Can you get up? Where are you getting up from? Yeah, I'm making I'm making a very bold jump. Oh yep. my god! Okay, let's, let's go. go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We made it. We made it. Yep. Okay, we can. Do I it. can't believe I just made that oh jump. Oh my honestly. god, that was! I'm surprised you made that. Whew. Oh, and the music and everything. Oh geez. Okay. This is actually tense. I bailed out of that warthog right before it fell into the chasm, and I just landed right on that random ass fucking strut. Oh my god. We're sinking. No, we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Forgot how intense this mission gets. The ground is quite literally falling apart beneath us. The opposite of the sky is falling. <laughs> yeah. The ground is leaving. Yeah. Oh man, and it's not. It's also like pretty open ended. I think there's a lot of different paths you could take with this mission. Definitely, definitely. I've played this mission so many times. Yeah, which is again uh, great level design, having the choice, or at least it feels like choice. I mean, you do have choice in this. Definitely, and it, it's it's really it's nice and simple too. Like they didn't they didn't like yeah they didn't have to think too hard when they made it. They just. They were just because when you try too hard, yeah. that's when you die hard. That's another. It's very true. Because when you try hard, that's when you die hard. That's how he says it. He's right. Oh, here we go. This is the oh, last yeah. level, I think. 
Last little battle station. Oh, yeah. And then you got Cortana giving you the percentages. It's, you play by play. It's a pretty this is this is pretty epic as far as sci fi set pieces go. Oh, for real. OK, what? Um, for real. My mom just walked in. I figured what what's up? Okay, can you, I'm kind of like it right in the middle. Can you like wait a minute? Like several minutes? No, no, I want to go to sleep. Oh my God. Well, I'm right in the middle of doing something. Can you just wait like 10 minutes, please? <laughs> can you please wait 10 minutes? Can you wait like 10 minutes, please? Thank you. You should leave that in, honestly. That's hilarious. Uh, oh, shit. Okay, let's wrap this up. We're, we're on a timer in multiple ways, so this is a very... That's what I was saying. It's like it was so, like, hilariously relevant. Uh, I mean, reality is just, uh... Basically, uh... Breaking down in front of us right now. In more ways than Truly. One. Okay, am I going the right way? Yeah, this way. Okay. Yep, we're on It's hard to bed. see around that bend sometimes. Should I go this for this really? jump? Uh, there yeah. you go around it, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think I should go straight here. Oh, man, they're throwing out all the stops now. 90%. Dude, I'm dropping all these sentinels. Holy <laughs> shit. They're just like, they're getting bodied. Oh, man. Okay. And here we go. The final descent. <sighs> this is a great cutscene, too. Made it. Yeah, this is one of the best cutscenes ever. It reminds me oddly of Metal Gear Solid. It does. It has this sort of racing finality to it that's so grand and like yet personal because you're following Chief yep. and Arbiter. It's and that, that's like that right there is like the full circle of in the beginning of the game when uh, Chief and Arbiter are, at least, are literally at each other's throats. Right. Right. Yeah. Now they're like saving they're each other's brothers. lives. Yeah. It's pretty yep. awesome. I always like like their dynamic quite a bit. Even though one of them is an alien and one of them is a human. Like, it's just, it's so great how they did that. The Arbiter is oddly such a relatable character for being a really is. nine foot tall alien. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. a nine foot tall lizard alien with two thumbs. It's like, you totally like this get shot, his man. plight. Uh, yep. I love this shot. Oh, it's coming up actually. The Yeah, we'll see. Yep. I honestly, I know that people give the whole Cortana thing a lot of shit. I really think that, that Cortana is a really, really great female character. She is. Like, I really think that she embodies femininity in a very, very respectful way. She's yep, almost like the yep. most soulful person in the game, despite being obviously this. Not digital, a person. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. She's very expressive, too, her voice actor. It's great. Yeah, she's the most human one. Yeah. Surely we watch this, too. This is just, this is great here, too. All right. I've got a pair of respects. For us, the storm has passed. The war is over. But let us never forget those who journeyed into the howling dark and did not return. Their decision required. <laughs> they kind of made Arbiter into a movie star for a second. They really did. I think there's something really symbolic about the fact that uh, Arbiter was the one who glassed Reach. Right. 
and here he is accepted by the humans and he, he admits that he was wrong you know what i mean like he he's, knows that he was misled he's a story of and i think he says something about it here yeah redemption redemption truly this part's very it's like here. really really at the end of the day he was uh he's he's a good man or good alien you know what i mean like right. he was just doing what he believed in right he's honorable yeah, see, I can't forgive you, but you have my thanks. Right. But Arbiter doesn't need his forgiveness. He did what he had to do. Exactly. That's what he says uh, in the beginning of the game. See, he's like, I know he's not dead. I that tough that motherfucker. I love Words that so easy. Words yep. so easy. It's just saying so much without saying yep. very much at all. Yep. Your favorite character, right? Yep, here he is. I don't relate to him, but he's my favorite character. No, yeah. What great dialogue here. Yeah. It is. Halo dialogue is great because it's not long-winded. It's just brief and to the point, and it's... Brevity is the soul of wit. Right. It's it's honestly really like kind of Shakespearean. It's great. It's well written. You know what's funny about one one seven? It's one of those recurring numbers I see, and I, I guess Halo oh, maybe too. started it, but I still yeah. see it in a lot of things. I remember seeing on the Bungie forums way back. People were like, "Do you ever notice the fact that you <laughs> see the number one one seven everywhere?" And I'm like, mm -hmm. I do. I still do. And I think about that thread all the time because yeah. I really do. Yeah, it's funny how that works. That was my uh, that was my number in school actually. Really? Yeah. What do you mean your one one seven four eight one zero? I mean, it was it's it's a fine ending on its own too because it was open ended to interpretation. But I guess they did like leave some area open for a sequel at some point, and that's kind of they what did. Infinite. And in the legendary ending, they teased that he's going toward a planet. Right. Like there's like a planet on the horizon, but. Uh, I definitely like the idea that Bungie was ending it where it was like he won and he didn't die in combat, mm -hmm. but he just goes to the long sleep. It's almost like he ascended. He just, yes, he fulfilled his he purpose get, and he he's, it's Christ-like. He a gets sense. to rest. Exactly. Is what it is. It's Which like is, finally he is done and he can rest. Like Jesus could rest. Yeah. Like snake rested at the end of uh, Metal Gear Solid. Four. exactly exactly it's 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 a very good conclusion it is it's peace really is what it is it's peace exactly at the end of his war and he finds peace. yet just like with peace wake me when you need me yep what a great line right there too. that really is it wake <sighs> me when you need me right because it's, it's always temporary, isn't it? Yep. 